musical movements. This concert firmly set New York City on course to become the diverse and vibrant center for the arts it is today. These and other shows from your PBS station are available with Passport on the PBS Video app. Download it today. The Patrick and Shirley Ryan Grant for Creativity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship makes possible stories that enrich lives and inspire our communities. Maestro Ennio Morricone was a great composer. I will love you. It's really hard to pick one or two soundtracks of, of Ennio Morricone's library. We listen and we watch the movies and we picked up the best ones. Saturday at 8.30 on WTTW. Chicago is one of America's mightiest cities. But have you ever wondered how it ended up way out here in the middle of the country? The story starts with waterways. To tell this epic story, we take to the skies where we can see the big picture. Beyond Chicago from the Air. Hi, Chicago. You're watching WTTW. Tonight's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the Mollenhauer Progressive Philanthropic Fund in honor of Ida Mollenhauer, supporting quality journalism. Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. We'll be joined by our Week in Review guests in just a moment. But first, some of today's top stories. Chicagoans will get to weigh in on and learn more about new ward map proposals next week. The City Council's Rules Committee announced two virtual public hearings on the newly released proposed map favored by the Council's Black Caucus. Those meetings will take place next Tuesday at 3 and Friday at 1 in the afternoon, and again, they'll be virtual. The City Council's Latino Caucus has filed for its proposed map to be placed on next June's primary ballot as a public referendum. We'll have much more on this remap battle in just a bit. A surprise hospital visit today from a husband and wife bearing gifts. Former President and former First Lady Barack and Michelle Obama surprised patients at U Chicago's Comer Children's Hospital, giving out gifts and chatting with some of the residents. The two also met with community leaders about anti-violence initiatives and then toured the trauma center at U Chicago after yesterday's visit to a Southside YMCA. The Chicago Bears might not be the only organization leaving the city for Arlington Heights. Chicago-based United Airlines today announced it will move up to 900 workers from the Willis Tower in the Loop to a facility in that northwest suburb next spring. The new facility is reported to become United's primary operations center, but United is expected to maintain hundreds of employees, including senior leadership, at the Willis Tower. And now to our Week in Review panel. Joining us are Craig Delamore of WBBM News Radio, Greg Pratt of the Chicago Tribune, Mike Lowe of WGN TV News, and Lynn Sweet of the Chicago Sun Times. And let's get right to it. Here's what the chairman of the City Council's Latino Caucus had to say about the Black Caucus's newly proposed ward map. This would be a joke if it wasn't such an incredible failure and breach of trust. Greg Pratt to the Chicagoan that says, of all the things I need to be concerned about, why am I hearing so much about maps right now? What is your response? Well, who represents you and why they represent you is one of the most critically important things in Chicago and in any democracy. So that's why we're talking about how they're trying to map it out, not just by race, but also sometimes by cutting out their enemies. Yes, and, and that certainly seems to be uh, represented in some of these proposals. Craig Delamore, the big tussle has been between City Council's Black and Latino Caucus. Is there any indication that they're moving toward a compromise? Uh, not really. Uh, the closest that they have come is that the 
uh, Black Caucus had been trying to stick with having the 18 members it currently has, or the 18 wards that are majority uh, African American wards. Uh, however, uh, there has been huge population losses in those wards, and they have seem to settle in that maybe it'll be 17. Certainly it is under the uh, the map that has been proposed by the, uh, the rules committee. The real problem is with the Hispanic uh, caucus, the Latino caucus. Right now there are uh, 15, 13 Latino wards. They say it should go to 15 because of the increase in population among those wards. Right, reflecting those population gains. And Lynn Sweet, there was a lot of crowing here in Chicago about the December 1st deadline for City Council to get 41 votes to approve any map before a referendum. Then the deadline comes and goes, and they still have time over the next few months to figure this out amongst themselves. Why is that? Well, let's so people understand this uh, December 1 deadline was phony. It was self-imposed. It means that they now need 41 votes to avoid a referendum. This is just simple arithmetic. Okay, I, and I, I think that when we think of this and frame it, uh, the referendum is the worst outcome for every member of council or everyone who wants to run uh, for city council because then it's out of your hands. This is going to go to a deal. There is plenty of time. I know it sounds dramatic and you know the aldermen are crying fair or not fair, the one, the first people that get together a coalition for a map that gets 41 votes, uh, it's settled. Just because now we're talking about it in terms of a black map and a Latino map. Uh, one thing that we should point out, every map, I believe, for the first time puts Chinatown in one place that will probably produce uh, an Asian American member of the city council. But to, let's keep this simple. Okay, it's just a matter of finding 41 aldermen who could have agreement. They'll make coalitions, they'll make deals, and this is uh, getting a lot of publicity because it is important, maybe not your everyday life, people got a lot on their plate, Paris, I know it, but you're just seeing it. One quick thing that really should happen is they, this rules committee's got to put this map online and make right. it so people can enlarge it, look at it, it can be done. The state general assembly did it, and you could sit there and look and find out where your house is. It's unconscionable that these that, that proposed map it, is not online it, in a way that people could look you're, at. And it. you're talking about the proposed map favored by the Black Caucus, which was uploaded in a PDF, and it's nearly impossible to read. Although I think sure. some other okay. folks uh, tried I to. I hope everyone who is listening in city council finds this as abhorrent and uh, as it is. Put the map online. If you don't know how to do it, call Dan Harmon, the state senate president, or Chris Welch, the state speaker of the House. They and they know how to. Do, although I think there are some of our observers that have tried to take it upon themselves to try to make it look a little clearer. Mike Lowe, um, the rules committee brought in a, a, an interesting person to sort of lead this map drawing for the map favored by the Black Caucus. That is Mike Casper, who has been the longtime counsel for House Speaker Mike Madigan. Uh, why do you think that uh, they went that route? I think it's unclear, especially because that just casts the the Madigan stink, if you will, on the whole process. And to, to Lynn's point about these artificial deadlines, the mayor herself was out of town on the day that the city council was supposed to vote on this. So I think what we're going to see, like Lynn said, is some kind of compromise hammered out in the back rooms and maybe Casper is the one to, to be the catalyst to do that. Although there's folks like 13th Ward Alderman Marty Quinn who is Madigan's protege. There's indicted 14th Ward Alderman Ed Burke who wants to make sure that uh, his ward uh, may remain safe for him should he run for re-election. And Greg Pratt, there are all these little nicks and knacks in this map that sort of punish potential challengers to incumbents. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Well, in uh, in the 50th ward, um, Deb Silverstein's ward is drawn where Haley Kazada is not uh, is not in the ward in Burke's ward. And this uh, is someone who has talked about challenging Silverstein. 
That's right. You know, and there's similar stories in other wards, like in uh, Jim Gardner's ward, the 45th ward, and and the 14th ward at Burke's ward, in the 43rd ward, Michelle Smith's ward, which, of course, everyone puts their hands up and say, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're trying to do. And of course, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but it uh, it's one of those things that doesn't look good. Even and Gilbert Viegas, the uh, Latino uh, caucus chair, feels that his ward was stretched out into areas heretofore unknown uh, to punish him for challenging the the, uh, the black caucuses. Uh, right. Map. Viegas has led the charge on the I, Latino caucus map. Just think, it's 41. The people who you just described in those wards, perhaps the white majority wards, they now have enormous leverage in the process that they did not have uh, a short time ago because they could be a block, move a you know, move a line a few blocks here, give me this, give me that. Uh, you just just keep thinking 41, and right. as soon as another third block gets together, Right. Uh, then they have the power to make the deal. Yeah, you, that, that, you, you bring up a good point. Some of those uh, white aldermen or other uh, aldermen, they, they have some leverage now because none you know of these groups, remember. Latino or black, have 41 votes. But I want to mention... There is you, another, remember, there is another map. And oh, please, the people's map. It's, yes. it's, it's just a suggestion. Everybody could have a map. If they put this stuff online, uh, many people can submit maps as they did in the state. Okay, uh, so this this is a you know to you know as a public interest group, put it online, let everybody draw a map. They did this in the state, but in the end, I can't emphasize this enough. The the, the this there will be a third block emerging that will swing back and forth to see what map can help them the well, most, and then the deal will be well, made. Well, Craig Delamore, uh, there's one incumbent alderman, 11th Ward. Uh, Patrick Daly Thompson, who is also under federal indictment, the nephew of Richard M. Daly. The 11th ward is where a proposed majority Asian American ward would be now, to which he put out a letter saying that that would be racist. Why is that? Well, he was saying that he has been able to represent a diverse community and should be uh, appreciated for that and that it should not be, uh, he, although he did walk it back a little bit and say he was not saying that he thought a 49% uh, Asian ward would be enough for the people of Chinatown, because they frankly said quite quickly, oh, no, it's not. Um, but as an alderman who was under indictment, he is being, I think, looked over as somebody that they can shove aside, as is uh, Carrie Austin, who is also under indictment and has now agreed to not or decided she will not run again, rather than be in a ward that has been diluted. This is the longtime 34th ward alderman, uh, Carrie Austin, who's 34th Second in ward. Seniority. Is it, it, right, and, and that 34th ward is moving from the south side to the near west side. Uh, uh, Mike Lowe, is it uh, the, the mayor on this program and on others said she had supported an independent process for drawing the map. That is not what is happening here. Does she deserve some scrutiny for, for perhaps going back on that promise? Indeed. Uh, I think anytime a public official makes a promise look like that and then we have this kind of mess and all the different plans that are out there without an independent plan, uh, certainly she deserves some criticism for the way this is going right now. But it's early, and I think we'll get to a point where we reach some sort of uh, compromise agreement, and and nobody will be happy. And <laughs> Lynn, she's also the way these, these she, things go. The mayor's also gotten grief for being in Washington D.C., where you are, uh, instead of presiding over this December first special city council meeting where the maps were taken up. Was that a productive trip uh, out there? Well, let me address this grief. It came mainly uh, questions from the reporters uh, during a 53, maybe 53-minute-plus epic uh, Zoom session. Uh, Greg was on it. Greg was on it. Uh, so this trip took weeks and weeks to plan. She had uh, meetings at the White House just putting together a delegation dinner. It is ridiculous to think that she knew in advance that Wednesday would be the day that another map would be proposed. I think really pull up the microscope a little bit. There wasn't anything she could have done at, that she couldn't have done by phone or Zoom. So when you ask, is it productive? There is so much money coming to 
uh, the state of Illinois, the city of Chicago, other agencies, other units of governments, that the more she knows about the ins and outs of getting the money and all the rules are being written right now, she met with the top people in the White House that are still forming the rules. You know, we write that a billion plus is coming to Illinois. It doesn't mean you just get a check and that's it. You know, some is formula, some is discretionary. We have, we, the city of Chicago, has a office here. Think of it as a branch of City Hall. Uh, the, the woman who runs the uh, city of Chicago office was with the mayor, okay? I followed him around. Yesterday, she met with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Oh, she did have two fundraisers while she was here, speaking of money. So she probably has some leverage here for the city of Chicago as these rules are being written around some of the federal money that's going to be coming to the city in the infrastructure law. Uh, Craig Delamore also this week, uh, the mayor uh, announced that she's dropping the lawsuit against the FOP and controversial president John Catanzara without prejudice. Why that move? Well, what she says is that it's because so many police are ob obeying the uh, the mandate that it shows that although Catanzara has been publicly urging his members to defy the law, that they're ignoring him. Now Catanzara has a different uh, view of uh, how many of his members are obeying the law and saying that it's only because the mayor has threatened their jobs, which frankly that was the whole point of the uh, the mandate. But nevertheless. Uh, she's saying it's because he's being ignored and this lawsuit filed by the FOP that is a counter lawsuit is still in effect and uh, still moving forward. A lot of sound and fury here, but Greg Pratt, uh, Catanzara and the FOP got a favorable ruling just uh, within the last hour from the Illinois Labor Board. Tell us about that. Well, it's positive. It's not, this, it's not the end, but the Labor Board agreed that there is enough evidence to hear a complaint that they had brought that the city has a duty to bargain with them over the vaccine mandate. So the city has not lost that, uh, which was a misunderstanding on my part, but uh, it's not a good thing for the city either because they're gonna have to defend themselves and the labor board does not bring people in willy nilly. They only bring people in when they think there's sufficient evidence to show. So that's, uh, that's another next step in the long winding saga of days of our vaccine lives. Days of our vaccine mandate lives. All right, another saga here uh, that's fit for soap opera is the Jesse Smollett trial number two. Prosecution made its case. The defense just started making its case. Uh, Mike Lowe, set the scene inside the Cook County courtroom for us. Well, I think the first question most people have is, is this still going on? <laughs> and of course, the we, everybody thought it, it was over, and then the pandemic delayed. You know, we had the the um, looking back into the charges by Special Prosecutor Dan Webb, and uh, Justice Smollett has been reindicted on six counts of disorderly conduct for lying to police on police reports, making false statements. So we thought there was going to be kind of a circus atmosphere. Kind of like what we saw in the last couple of weeks in Kenosha, where there were protesters outside and, and all kinds of things going on. That really hasn't been the case this week at uh, the Layton Cook County Criminal Court building. It's been very quiet outside. Jesse Smollett has been showing up with his uh, entourage of family members and lawyers. And uh, the, the prosecution over the course of four days made a pretty methodical case showing uh, video evidence, uh, really talking to both of the bodybuilding brothers, uh, Olab and Abel Osendairo, who uh, they claim that Smollett uh, enlisted their help uh, in kind of creating this and orchestrating this, what has been called a hoax hate crime attack. Um, and so it's, there have been moments of tension and drama, uh, mainly because the judge, J uh, James Lynn, has, has kind of pushed uh, to get this done quickly. He has made it clear he wants this to be a speedy trial, an efficient trial, and uh, he's been having the jury sit and hold court for 12, 13-hour days. Uh, today, he decided to give them a day off and resume um, the trial on Monday, and the big question for Monday is, will Smollett himself take the witness stand in his own defense. And Smollett, you would think, would uh, have to take the witness stand, but you mentioned the Osendairo brothers, the bodybuilding brothers, friends of Smollett. Uh, they're part of, uh, their testimony is part of the evidence uh, that this indeed was an alleged 
staged a hate crime. How compelling was their testimony on the stand? It was very compelling and convincing because the exact and, and several police officers, Chicago police detectives, uh, were also uh, witnesses in this case. I think there were 26 total officers who investigated and four of them uh, went to the witness stand to testify that what the Osen Dairo brothers told them actually checked out. And then the jury saw frame by frame video evidence of, for example, uh, Jussie Smollett's Mercedes Benz driving around uh, Ashland and Irving Park just at the time that that the brothers said it did, uh, that they said they were meeting with him, that he gave them a hundred dollar bill and they went to the crafty beaver uh, to buy the supplies, including a red hat to make it look like they were Trump supporters, uh, that he told them exactly the, the things to say that he thought would get media attention and it clearly did so there's this mounting uh, there's mountain of evidence there's that testimony there's the police officers tell us in short what uh, the smollett version of this uh, story is so Josie smollett's defense is that this was a real crime and that he is a real victim in other words that the osandairo brothers did attack him uh is what he's claiming, saying that it was a hate crime because they were homophobic. And there is some evidence that they have shared text messages uh, saying insensitive things about gay people in the past, but there's also ample evidence that they're not homophobic, which was presented by the prosecution. For example, both of them participated in the gay pride parade in Chicago in 2015 and worked as bouncers at Boys Town Bars and even went to the famous bathhouse on Halstead Street, Steamworks, a number of times with Jussie Smollett. So that doesn't really paint a picture of people who are homophobic, even if they may have used some insensitive language in text messages from years ago. Uh, that is the defense, that this is a real crime and Smollett is a real victim. And that it was the Osandairo brothers in, in his eyes that, that perpetrated this. Uh, and we'll have to see what he says if he takes a stand next week. Certainly isn't a, a speedy trial or perhaps as speedy as the judge wanted. Let's move on to the spike in COVID cases we've seen this week. Chicago Department of Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwadi was on Chicago Tonight last night. She talked about this spike. Take a look. The combination of an increase in cases and an increase in positivity tells us that this is not just an artifact related to testing over Thanksgiving. Uh, this is unfortunately a continued increased uh, surge. Greg Pratt, uh, the doctor also said that it doesn't mean that there are going to be any new mitigations or shutdowns or capacity limits uh, like that. Do you think that, that, that they could come up with something else like ma mandating vaccines to go to restaurants or bars or clubs like New York has done? Well, you know, nationally, with the, with the prevalence of the vaccine, where if you're unvaccinated, it's because you don't want to be, uh, public uh, policymakers everywhere don't want to do any more ma any more restrictions and in Chicago they don't really want to do mandates like forcing restaurants to do that they want them to do it by themselves so in Chicago we're probably looking at this more or less the status quo for a while until and unless um, hospitals start getting overwhelmed and it's a really really challenging um, it's a really challenging public policy question to balance the variety of things because of the availability of the vaccine, which makes a difference both in terms of spread and in terms of how sick you get. And on a national level, in uh, President Biden is trying to lay out a winter strategy, which includes free access to at-home COVID tests. Uh, tell us how, how necessary those are. Well, it's, it's one of the pillars of what the Biden administration is trying to do to try and address the emergence of this and to have insurers pay for these tests. Uh, it's one thing I don't think home testing alone will take the pressure off of the Biden administration. There is a medical uh, you know, pandemic problem here and also it's a political problem for whether or not the Biden administration can which came to power saying they know how to manage this pandemic. Uh, and now we have this uh, new variant on the scene. So the home testing, I think, is one, not the most uh, important component here. Just two days ago, we had the first case only in California, and now we already have the spread. So the challenge here is 
political and communicating and maybe convincing more people to get the vaccine. And then you have the complicating factor of, of course, uh, getting people also on the booster. I would say right now, too soon to say if the Biden winter COVID plan will help him politically and help, most important, uh, mute the rise and the spread of this variant. Certainly, uh, COVID mitigations and vaccinations have become totally political uh, in many parts of the country. Craig Delamore, what about Chicago public officials? What are they looking out for with the mm-hmm. Omicron variant now that there are multiple reports of folks in the United States who have caught that variant? Well, the mayor has said that, uh, and, and Dr. Arwitty, uh that they are on the lookout for it. They expect it to be here. It may already be here, and we just haven't seen it yet. But no one is predicting that there are going to be any more mitigations. What is important to remember is that there is already an indoor mask mandate in place statewide. And Governor Prisker has said, especially since the state one day this week, I believe it was Wednesday, had 11,000 new cases of uh, coronavirus in the state. That's the the most in a year. That's the most. And the last time it had that much or more, there were no vaccines widely available. Yes, and it was only 6,000 the day before. So something serious is going on here. Don't expect that mask mandate to go anywhere anytime soon. And what about uh, holiday plans, Craig? Are, are public officials going to recommend not gathering or, or not traveling? They haven't done it yet. Uh, but what they keep saying is exercise caution. Do the things that we were doing before the vaccine and just do them again to keep yourself and your family from getting sick. All right, um, Lynn, I want to go back to some national news. As you know, uh, the Supreme Court heard the Mississippi abortion case in which uh, justices hinted that they might overturn Roe v. Wade entirely. Illinois uh, has abortion uh, protections uh, on on the books. Uh, Are those uh, certain to stay around should the court indeed overturn Roe v. Wade? Yes, because Illinois is run by uh, Democrats, and for the foreseeable future, we probably will have a Democratic uh, General Assembly and uh, governor. One byproduct of that, of the Texas uh, crackdown on abortion, and what everyone knew was this coming Supreme Court case, is that the state legislature passed a repeal of the parental notification law in Illinois, which the governor if he hasn't signed it already, has said that he would. Uh, Illinois is braced to become one of the safe haven states where you can have with certainty, at least in the coming years, know that abortion will be available here no matter what the Supreme Court says. And given the arguments, as you noted, it looks like a 6-3 decision to erode existing abortion rights is coming down the road. Although we did have uh, uh, someone who was from an anti-abortion group on this program say they, they're not going to stop there, that they do want to come after states that still uh, have uh, abortion laws on the books. We're going to have to leave it there. Our thanks to Lynn Sweet, Craig Delamore, Greg Pratt, and Mike Lowe. And that is our show for this Friday night. Now for the Week in Review, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you all for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great weekend. is made possible in part by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, wishing all a happy and healthy holiday season.